Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome to WTFFF and the special HP series. I'm excited about all the stuff we've got going on and this is one of our really early episodes that we're going to be doing in this series and I was so excited when I got to talk to this guy from HP because they're working on some really cool philosophical thinking process about megatrends. I didn't even realize that they were doing this kind of advanced work, but I have to tell you, after interviewing Ed, I really... I got it by the end of it, and I'm interested to talk about that with you after the interview. I, I got it, and it makes sense why they are doing all this research in megatrends. Right. So, you know, this is the thing. Change is a reality. Change is accelerating. Change is also a challenge, and no one knows that better than Edward Davis. He's the director of 3D Strategy, chief technologist officer, so the CTO's office of HP. And uh, he's the direct, he's director of all those. He's the newest and fastest growing that the 3D and digital manufacturing strategy is the newest and fastest growing of three HP's three global business units. Think about that. Digital manufacturing strategy is at a high growth. Ed has over 30 years experience in printing, um, technology investigations and product development. Ed's current responsibility is translating megatrend and competitive analysis into the vision for the digital manufacturing industry and developing the execution strategy for creating this manufacturing ecosystem from design through production to use. Love that. Ed is recognized for his depth in product life cycles from design through manufacturing, including part manufacture, product assembly, distribution, and use. Previously, Ed held a series of positions in HB's 20 billion estimated print business, focusing on creating and scaling new business opportunities. I think the real big question, Tom, as we go into this is, how do we or any company decide to invest? And that's where these megatrends fit in. How do we decide to invest our time, our money, our energy? We talk about that all the time. Like it, it doesn't matter whether you're at the low level in a small business, you're doing it as an entrepreneur, or you're doing it at a big business size. We have to have a basis for making some of these decisions and choices. And that we have to also have a business, a, a business model that helps us stay sustainable under disruption. So I always thought it was kind of ironic that we had so many 3D print companies that got disrupted by the disruption of 3D printing, like they didn't manage to make it sustainable. And yet HP took that slow and steady pace, right? Like think about it, we hardly ever talked about HP on this 560 oh, shows, we, a handful of times because- no, It was just, you know, we heard they were interested in it, they were working on it, but we were all guessing. Nobody really had any idea how they were approaching it, why they were approaching it, but I think Today, we're peeling back the curtain on that. And we're getting some insights in it. And it makes me even more excited about the 3D print industry again. Me too. You and I just had a conversation about that. We'll talk about that at the end. But I'm so excited to bring you a conversation on megatrends, a conversation on a couple of other things that you're going to find fascinating as well with Edward Davis. Hey, Ed. So glad to talk to you again. Hey, Tracy. How's life? <laughs> We're good. Tom and I are just like super excited to talk megatrends with you. But before we start, what I really want to do is is sort of talk this little detail about you know, we're getting a lot of blips in our trends right now, right? We're getting these other things yeah. that are giving us little waves in them. Do we, yeah. con do we consider the megatrend, uh, part of our megatrend? Yeah. Do they consider the shift? What's the impact of the things like sequestering yeah. and quarantining and, and buying habits that are changing because of what's going on in the world? Yeah, should we introduce that? That what is a megatrend first and then talk about what the, what's the implication of the current situation? Yeah, let's talk about that. What's a megatrend? Okay, so first, megatrends, uh, one, it's not an HP invention. If you Google it, you can Wikipedia it. They're major uh, trends in the world, which are either social or economic or, or technology. Um, we do our own version of megatrends in HP uh, because our intention is to be in business 10 years from now or 20 years from now, and we need to make the, the right decisions based on where the world is going. So the megatrends currently that, that we, we talk about are uh, things like rapid urbanization, 
uh, everybody moving towards uh, towards cities. This is going to happen. Uh, there may be a blip in it right now because nobody can move. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is that people go where the money is and the money tends to be where the cities are. So the, the major trend won't change, but maybe some themes below rapid urbanization will change as a result of the current situation. As but it's example, worth watching in that particular case, like thinking about rapid urbanization, are we now all a little scared off of this plan that we might have moved closer to the city and we might rethink that? So we have to watch it, right? There, there, there's definitely, so you see if the world lives through a bad situation like the Great Depression, it changes behaviors, right? Uh, my, my grandparents, they never put money in the bank after the Great Depression. They put the money in the freezer. You know where the you know where the word cold hard cash <laughs> comes from. I'm not joking. You put no, it's true. Money, That's why we're you laughing. You put your money in a big freezer with a lock on it, and no, you know the freezers back then they weighed like two tons. Nobody's going to steal that. There's a great safe. So yes, it's going to change the the way that we behave. What what I see, however, is that more than going against the megatrends is going to accelerate certain things. And let, let, me, let, me give, let me give you the second kind of uh, trend that we identify in HP, uh, which is changing demographics. The world is growing older. Yes, this, this, may this situation may change the average age of the world for some period of time. But generally speaking, the medical system permits that people will live longer. And the themes below, people living longer, will be accelerated. The need for better medicine, the need for uh, accelerated diagnostics, local, less expensive diagnostics, um, the, the need for digital care. Um, you know, what, what you've seen in the, in the past month uh, here in San Diego, I forget which hospital, they were doing, before this happened, they were doing 50 remote physical therapy. One week later, they're down, to, they're up to 2000 per day. Yeah. It's like all the physical therapy went, went remote. You, well, if you can, you know, if you can teach somebody and guide somebody through the exercises through zoom, well, why not? These things will be accelerated uh, and the adoption of, of different methodologies will be accelerated by the current situation, um, not necessarily decelerated. Right. Well, because do we want, like, that's the big question we see circulating around. Do we want to go back to the way things were, right? Like, or is this so much better, right? So we have to consider that. It, and you're right. It, it, it makes an acceleration, a rapid acceleration. Of What's a going to happen is rapid acceleration. Now, it, it's worth that I mentioned that the third megatrend that, that we have uh, identified in, in HP, because this one, uh, I think we need to change the word. The third, the third trend that we had was hyper-globalization. I think we need to change that to hyper-connectivity. Mm. It means the same thing. We're all more connected with the world around us than, than you know, but hyper-globalization, I, I think <laughs> this actually gets me to the, to the 3D printing point that I'll make in a second. The hyper-connectivity is happening. There, there have been a lot of more people are working at home. I was already able to work at home. HP is a technology company. We do a lot of things remotely. I think a lot of companies now have, have rationalized that you can do events remotely. You can, you can do customer support remotely. Uh, you can do all these things remotely. And so the, the need for connectivity, the need for software security, everybody knows yeah. about, the, about the Zoom bombing, right? Uh, yes, the need for security becomes even more accelerated because we've gone because we've gone through this. Uh, but the, and that provides your fourth one, which is accelerated innovation, right? So there isn't a time at which we have to accelerate our innovation than when we desperately need a vaccine, we need a we need parts and materials, yeah. right? And that's where three D printing's been coming in really big. So this is where this is where three D printing and even worth mentioning is the the use of of new medical devices for for local diagnostics. What what maybe not known in the world is that we also have a 3D printer, a 2D printer uh, that's used to dispense micro particles for the investigation of pharmaceuticals or vaccines. Ah. You know, so these sorts of things would just 
the the need for them has never been greater uh the need for local supply chains has never been greater and so this i think is actually going to become a, a a turning point for 3d in um in in the world the, the primary i'm excited for that and that yeah, that's the, actually yeah, yeah. yeah i mean so exactly. that's something what we were talking about before is that like you know the hype cycle of 3d printing was was seemed like it was over and you well, know it's like oh, do yeah. we really want to talk more about 3d printing and that's why the show had kind of yeah. had a little lag in there because we were we weren't as excited about it anymore but there, it's coming back to excitement don't there, you think well there also there also were false expectations and <laughs> and and, yeah. and bad speculations by by financial analysts that were trying to name the next big thing right yeah. so, so they they didn't really understand the industry sure. so the value the value of of 3d printing is is gotten a vehicle for proving the the value proposition which is the current situation in um in the medical industry the need for personal protection devices the need for uh ventilator parts the need for maybe new ventilator designs the the value there's two primary values that we can prove now uh to the world through this example of the medical industry which is 3d printing can accelerate the the time to market now, the fact is you can't skip a development and validation phase. If you're making something as complicated as a ventilator, you, you, you can't really, <laughs> yeah. need, you really need to validate that the thing works. You can't just go from design to production, which is a fallacy. You have to validate that the thing not only works, but it meets the requirements of a ventilator. I don't know if you guys are familiar with ventilators. Oh they're, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not respirators, they're assisted breathing devices. If you're trying to blow into my lungs when I'm trying to breathe out, you're suffocating me. The thing has to work, right? Yeah, it really does. But you know, this is a thing, you know, Tom, Tom, you know this better than anyone on the design side that how fast though acceleration can happen because of 3D print iterations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, certainly, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's critical to development and meeting people's needs. I mean, what we're right. Seeing now, not just on the development side, which I agree with you, Ed, you cannot shortcut development of a product and have it meet the needs. I was very concerned when I heard about these ventilators yeah. and hospitals are talking about splitting them and making one ventilator work for two people. I don't know how you synchronize two they people's have. breathing in and out in distress. Uh, maybe to, there's yeah. a way. I don't know. They but that seems be, like a tall task. That, that's, that's a dangerous situation they have to be matched they have to be perfectly matched conditions and so a more complicated thing would be to split the the air pressure with separate valving systems but then you're getting a really complicated mechanism and you might as well just make another ventilator. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, no, you know, no. let's not talk all about all about these kind of things because I want to get back to the megatrends. Well, um, I don't actually, know about you, but <laughs> yeah. But, but, but let me mention one thing, Tracy. I'm sorry. I, I, there, there's two value propositions of 3D printing. The first is time to market. The other one is um, digital distribution. And so this is also coming in. What I mean to say is flexible supply chain. We and others have come up with some uh, new solutions to things like uh, these these uh, protective face shields that we we come up with a design in Barcelona that met the requirements of the hospital. We passed the regulations in Europe. You know the distribution is the distribution is digital. Right. We put the file up on our website. People can download it. They can print it themselves wherever they are. Uh, and so the distribution value proposition or flexible supply chain is, is the other thing that I think we've got now a vehicle to demonstrate the value proposition, which should accelerate the inclusion of 3D printing in a normal supply chain. The inclusion, I don't mean to say we're not <laughs> right. going to replace. We're not going to replace. <laughs> we're we're going to be part of a hybrid supply chain model where you use injection molding for plastic when and where it makes sense. You, you use 3D printing in the same product when and where it makes sense. And th this, this I think will be proven out in the next few months in the medical industry, and then others will start to take note for their own industries. And I think it's a necessity matching, you know, or I'd say, it, there's a there's a need that happens in these kind of extreme times where it, it's kind of a 
think of it as a natural selection of sorts. Okay, yeah. there's a too big of a lead time on a certain part to make it the traditional way. Right. So what else can we do? Because we need these parts now, not right. four weeks from now. And right. and the solution presents itself. And, and it like you said, some parts will be traditionally manufactured. Others will be 3D printed. Or it will needed. be 3D printed for a period of time until the tooling can be completed because you right. know there's more you, you need yeah. to ramp up or whatever that is. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, showing that, you, right, the value proposition, as you put it, which is what we've seen for a long time. <laughs> yeah, which is, in fact, I mean, what you mentioned, Tracy, is what's called bridge manufacturing. Yeah. That you start with one to get to market. And then when it makes sense you and you have the tool ready, you convert to that because it's probably got cost efficiencies that the 3D printer does not. The hybrid model takes that one step further and says, look, if you've qualified that the 3D printed part is equal to the injection molded part, then why not use both processes in production? And as an example, use the injection molding for the stable production and use the 3D printing for either upside production because yep. of unforeseen forecasts, spare parts, or, or what they call pull supply chain. The other one is push supply chain. I make them and then I try to sell them. Pull supply chain is when you get the, when you get a request, you make it. It's the ultimate of just-in-time manufacturing. Well, and really we're seeing that now because we're seeing such a fluctuation in sales in the marketplace. But the other part that I really love about what this is also proving out about it is that validation phase. Because we talk about that a lot on our show, and just mm. in general. Now, we talk about it a lot from market and design validation, not just validation of how it should be made, how, how it's working. Like So there's a, a complexity to the types of a validation that you need to do. But being right. able to use 3D printing through that validation process process, I think for us has been proven to be the essentials actually accelerator in the innovation process. Right. Um, because otherwise you the market actually shifts while you're in the process of developing. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. When you get proof very much quicker, you get proof that your design works, that it meets the needs, right? Without mm -hmm. having to invest as much time or money. You know, that to me, that's been the critical benefit. Right, right. Now, so now, now all of these strategies, you know, they, 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 they always made sense. What we haven't had is the opportunity to demonstrate to the world the value proposition. And so you guys know as well as I do, we, we've kind of been preaching to the choir amongst ourselves about all of these of, well, we can, we, a lot of time, a lot of times we'll call it here. We don't have the killer app, right? This is the killer app, right? This is the killer application, literally, which is so horrible, but yeah. that's the truth of it. And that it, we needed something that really proved out how it would work in the process and, and do all of those things. So I, I'm, a, you know, I'm thrilled because in a, in a way this is, it really is highlighting what those of companies who have stayed the course, like HP, like what you've been doing, have stayed mm -hmm. the course in being saying, this is not, the hype cycle's not over and I'm not just quitting this. We're sticking with it because we believe this has a future. And I think this is where your mega trend analysis comes in. And right. I'd love for you to talk to people who are out there sort of making those decisions about where to invest and uh, um, for their own time and money, not to, you know, their own company's time and money, not just investing from a passive way. Like, you know, I'm going to invest in a 3d print company, um, how to think, how they think about the future. And then, and how we prevent this disruption or um, stay ahead of the disruption. Mm. How, how, how does that, I mean, it's great that you have a team and you analyze all these mega trends and you do it, but how do you really use it? How, how do we use, how we use our mega trends inside HP is um, we need to, if we're thinking about being in business 10 years, 20 years from now, um, we need to think about what are the sorts of skills that people are going to need in the future? And that affects hiring plans and that affects talent development uh, plans. Um, we need to consider how processes and tools like 3D printing will be evolving for our own uh, operations. Um, we need to think about what different business models are possible because of the digitization of the world and the automation of the world, you, you know that you know, things are, things are uh, changing in such a way that the old business models of uh, just selling 
uh, products is, is, is not the only one that, that, you, that you can do. And then finally, uh, we, need to, we need to actually consider things like um, where our products are gonna be sold in the future, who will be the sorts of people buying them, and how do we design our products to, to, to meet those, those people's well, and those And people's one of needs. our concerns is that we still see this, we see a, such a gap in design education uh, um, for this future world, right? Like I, I clearly see that even as I was, as you were giving me the full, and oh, I got right. the full presentation on the yeah. mega trends, which I loved so, because so. I'm a geek and I just love the back research, but okay. we're seeing, I, I know that you guys see that too, right? Yeah. Uh, so let me talk about the challenges then. So yeah. there, there's a, there's a video that I, that I referred to in our conversation, Chase, which what, I think if you Google, HP MJF chameleon or something like that. You'll see somewhere in YouTube because we'll have a link for everybody in the blog yeah, post. Nothing, so don't worry. Nothing, <laughs> nothing ever goes away in YouTube. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll find be, it. We have it. <laughs> you have to be careful what you say and do. Um, and what this is, is is a visionary video of where 3D printing can be, not next year, not five years from now, but uh, two, three decades from now. And it talks about the vision of being able to, and this is what a lot of people speculated on that this might be tomorrow, but it's not. What, what you could eventually do with 3D printing is print something as complicated as electromechanical robotic chameleon that has electrical parts, that's got sensors, that's got uh, mechanical structure, that's got skin, that's got all different properties. And you could print that without further assembly. Right, this is from the Star Trek uh, replicator. You know, <laughs> that's right. Punch some buttons, and then and that's what you get. Long term, we're 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 moving in that direction, but that's long term. And to because get to, we're still teaching siloed engineering, siloed electronics, siloed coding, right? Well, that, Everything's that's, still siloed today. Yeah, that's that's part of it, but but part of it also is that there's three there's there's three big challenges to get there. The first is to even talk about all this voxel control and multi-property, you first need to be uh, a scale production process. If you could only print one or two, you're not competing for scale production. So that's the first challenge and that's a shorter term thing. This, the other two challenges are, are these, you have to invent all of that multi-property control and that takes time. This is complicated multi-physics, this is not that simple to manipulate properties on, on a material. But imagine you could print something as complicated as that. How would you design it? Do you, you can't do voxel by voxel design. It's a ridiculous proposition to say voxel number one has this color, it has this mechanical property, has this texture, it has this electrical property. Voxel number two, it would take you forever to finish a design. And so an evolution of the of the design tools, the product design tools needs to happen along with the evolution of, of the printer's capabilities. And that evolution is what, what has been known as generative design. Mm. Now we're seeing the initial generative design, which is the simplest form, which is topology optimization. That's already happening. Siemens has got some, uh, some software that, that enables that. Several others have software that enables that. Siemens just came out with topology optimization for airflow. That's just topology optimization. That's not complex electromechanical robotic chameleon design, which is a whole different level of multi-physics complexity. Um, well, and when you think about it, today it takes multiple different people with education in different disciplines right. that are needed to create the entire product that's right and now if you're really going to make this happen in a machine that like you you know reference the the star trek you know uh replicator. futuristic replicator that you know you're not going to have any single person that has all that knowledge it's going to have to happen with software and ai and a number of things but how much influence on that will yeah. the human be able to have in making something unique versus there's a visionary influence that still needs to happen right <laughs> someone has to say i need this i want yeah. it yeah in the long in the long 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 term view 
it's democratized and you don't need so much uh, specialization. But that's the same, that's the same time frame as the, as the replicator. We're talk, probably talking 30, 40 years from now because the sophistication of the design tool, which needs to be integrated with the simulation tool of everything, has to be such that somebody without a formal education could make something complicated. We're, we're, that's beyond my lifetime. <laughs> so, well, so, so is the replicator, but that's like the, you know, the 30, 40, 50 year thing. There's a step before that, which is the design tools uh, need to enable professional uh, engineers like ourselves, Thomas, to do complicated things and such things as the embedding of electronics and mechanical parts. You know, those are two different tools. Right. Yes. There's an electrical design tool and they're, they're not integrated. There's no... no. Even if you and I had electrical and mechanical degrees, the design tools are separate and there's no way to integrate them. And so before you get to this democratization phase, there's a phase in which the design tools and the printers are very sophisticated for professional engineers. And that is within, that is within our, our lifetimes. So, you know, some of the other things that you also, we've kind of touched on it here, but there's like emerging technologies and trends that are going on within those emerging technologies themselves, growth mm. that has to happen there. So like we always, you know, we get in this like, 3D print is the next industrial revolution. And like we get in this, the hype thing of it. And then, but what we don't realize is all these other things that first off, some of them you've been talking about, but even some that are not even in our control, like big data and stuff has to yeah. come in and inform these things. And they aren't right. at that sophisticated level yet or no. where they could be. And so that's, uh -huh. you know, we really run into those. What are some of those emerging technologies that you see as essential for the, the sort yeah. of future? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk. Let's talk about automation. And let me take the opportunity to introduce the, the concept of Industry 4.0. So Industry 4.0, and <laughs> we need to spell it correctly. You need to spell it like it's German. I the I E. At, at the end, it's not Y. It's I E. And you spell it like you spell it in German because Industry 4.0 was defined by a consortium between government uh, and university and and industry in 2010 and they defined it as such the the i'm going to translate to english so this is <laughs> good <laughs> please this is my <laughs> the english version in short and the abridged english version uh which is industry 4.0 is the capture and use of the data across the entire product life cycle from concept through manufacturing through distribution sales installation repair and replacement and using Pretty comprehensive <laughs> the data and using the data analytics across that whole product life cycle, not just manufacturing. This is not manufacturing 4.0. This is product life cycle is broader than is broader than manufacturing. It's using the data across that entire product life cycle to real time make improvements across that, that whole product life cycle through data analytics and data analytics is the generic version. Machine learning is a type of data analytics. Artificial intelligence is a, is a type of data analytics. It's using data analytics to automate um, the, the flow of information um, across that whole product life cycle by looking for correlations between items that humans won't have the time to do. Or to tell As, each other about. That's the one part that we were talking about, right? Share with each other. Yeah, yeah. What happens today in, in normal manufacturing is most things, believe it or not, are, are not database-driven, uh, proactive uh, communication to the users. It's a guy sending an email to a guy or, uh, or a woman and then waiting to get an email response back and then probably not getting a response and then calling them, not getting an answer on the phone. The, the, the time delay of just communication in this product life cycle can, can be as slow as two or three weeks. 
Well, and I, I love the example, Ed, that we, we talked yeah. about before is like, you know, thinking about that, you've got a printer that's being serviced in a customer's facility. You want to, the repair person needs to be in and out. There's a problem he's, he or she has never seen before. They mm. can only send an email, make a phone call, try and do it. And the next thing you know, they just were like, let's just replace the printer because we, have, yeah. we didn't get an answer. It's not a, you know, right? It's, it's a lot. Of, yes. A lot of times what happens today is you just, you, you repair too much. Yeah. And, and we, we do that too, because if you've got a customer with a problem, you don't want to, you don't want to spend a couple of days getting to the root cause analysis. You want to get the guy's product working again. And so this is the sort of thing that data analysts can do. It can look at, at failures in the field and look for correlations between what happened upstream for that specific product. And did something fail in the top level assembly or did something fail in the part fabrication or did something break in the distribution or even worse go further upstream and say did did they know there was a design margin issue in R&D and they ignored it and the product actually by design has a design margin issue this is this is where recalls come from yeah and this we've seen it on the product side, so we know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Tom and I are kind of like looking at each other going, yep, been there, seen that, know it happens. <laughs> so wouldn't it be nice if the data would tell you, look, this is, this, is a, our, this is the problem. We've correlated it back. Inform the guy that's making the parts if that's where the root cause is. He needs to fix something right away, not wait for you to escalate back to him. And yeah. this is, this, this, in the end, the, the Industry 4.0, Again, it's not manufacturing 4.0. The real, the real winners in industry 4.0 are product owners. You can develop more complicated, more competitive products in less time with higher quality than you could without these analytics. And less liability and, and yeah, less because liability. Tom and I, Tom and I talk about this all the time. We have no idea how the automakers can stay in business because every time yeah. we take our car in, right, we go it's in and home. they replace like everything you turn around. And then sometimes they replace it two and three times. So like, you're like, how are they even still making money yeah. off this car? Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they probably make money on service as well. Yeah, well, and then that's, well, well, the service company is certainly making money. That's what we've yeah, decided. It, it is phenomenal to me how complicated uh, automobiles have, have become oh. and, and the reliability, although we still have to take in the car for repairs, the reliability has improved so much over the last 50 years. It's phenomenal that it can be as complicated as it is and still work. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm but, impressed. Yeah, but industry 4.0 is completely necessary in that model of business because yeah. they can't sustain the price pressure down, the quality up, the reliability up. Like all of that is an unsustainable business model if all, you don't improve the process around all, you. Yeah, all while becoming more and more competitive. What I'm kind yeah. of a fan of the auto industry. The auto industry has much more capacity to build cars than they sell every year. It is hyper competitive. The only way anybody grows is by stealing market share from everybody else. That requires that you have more and more competitive products. More and more competitive generally means more and more complex. And that's what we've seen. Well, and I think well, you guys have seen that too. <laughs> interesting oh, yeah. thing is though, more competitive sometimes means driving cost down and yeah. cutting corners like we saw take for instance the Takata airbag situation yeah. which was an engineering I would say you know oversight or or mm -hmm. flaw or you know a, a supplier being pressured to deliver a part yeah. at a cheaper price right you mentioned yeah. how complex these cars have gotten and they are incredibly complex Mm. car that I drove when I first learned to drive didn't have an airbag and it didn't have anti-lock brakes and it didn't have computers in it. I mean, now your baseline car has to have all of those things and more. Yeah. So it used to be, I wonder what you think about this. I mean, it used to be that engineering a part properly required some amount of failure to know where the yeah. limits of materials or processes are right. and how is our industry 4.0 going to be able to predict some of those things? Hmm. Ah, is it going to be able to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so, now on a good subject. I love it. Good job. <laughs> there you go, Tom. Good question. <laughs> exactly. 
All right, he's got a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, in, the, in the center of this data analytics are what, what they call digital twins. Now, again, you can Google this and get a more, a more detailed description of it, but there's at least three digital twins in those analytics. One is a digital twin of the manufacturing supply chain. Another one is the digital twin of the product's process versus the product's reliability. And the third one is um, a digital twin of, um, of, the, of the product itself relative to what the product is supposed to do. Now, these, this is complicated, so let me, use, let me use an example from 3D. The product digital twin in a 3D printer is a model of what are the printing parameters that affect the part quality. The manufacturing process uh, or the process twin is what parameters do I specify in the assembly line, including the part tolerances on the parts that affect the reliability of the 3D printer. And then the other one is simple. It's just the manufacturing supply, the manufacturing supply chain. Those models, um, there's, two, there's two ways to generate the, those models. The old fashioned way, which I think still has to come into play, is that you do the calculations, that the engineers developing the parts, developing the subsystems, have to come up with a correlation between the, the part specifications and the functionality, between the process specifications and the functionality. And that's, that's the way it's been done for, for years and years and, and, and years for sophisticated manufacturing products. I'm not talking about singular part products like shoe inserts, I'm talking about automobiles. The other way to generate these digital twins is data analytics. And you've probably heard of, um, uh, of learning engines, of machine learning, yes. where you, you have enough statistical data points to create a normal model and to create an anomaly model and then to see the difference between normal and, and anomaly. The problem with this second, with this machine learning creation of these digital twins is you need a lot of data for the machine learning to work. And so in, in uh, reality, the shortcut is to apply the domain knowledge as the base for a normal model, create your normal model based on what the engineer says, and then spend your time in the data analytics, either correcting his normal model because you see what, what he or she thought was normal is not quite normal, and focus on the anomaly model. That's Does that make great. sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we talk about this sometimes because we, we did a lot of chair designs. So we did a lot of five star bases, which you're all sitting on probably in your offices right now. And we would say, they're, they, if we let them do their normal plastic modeling, right? We look at it and yes. we go, we get, it's yeah, you're. You got it's a five star fine. base. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Almost everybody does. So, yeah. And so anyway, um, but yeah, so we would, we would look at it and the, the, you know, the engineers would come back and they'd say, oh no, the plastic needs to be beefed up and it needs to be done this. But we have 20 years of experience designing these things. And we'd say, no, you really don't have to because the design has this built into it. Like right. you can deviate from the model of the PE analysis. And so, you know, we were like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like that. But right? still, for us, it was still a process of make it and mm -hmm. test prove it, it yeah. break yeah. it, yeah. find <laughs> out where the breaking point is. Well, this this is where the the real data actually, um, as 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 you guys know, you can simulate something, but the level of simulation today, depending on what you're simulating, is an approximation of the truth. Yeah. Right. You, all, you always need to validate the simulation with empirical. And what the, what the machine learning does is actually, that's your data. That's your empirical data. You know, if, if, if I have in my 3D printer a way of measuring the part quality coming out of it, that's the real data. I can come up with my theory of what printing parameters affect part quality, but it's much better to correct that theory with real data. Um, and then your simulation goes from mm, potentially 90% correct to, to towards 100% correct, right? Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, well, I love that. Well, this has just been fascinating, Ed. I've got one really last question for you, and this is a big one. So take your okay. time on that one because I don't, I don't want to cut it short for anyone. But you know, you're being so generous. HP is being so generous with sharing your mega trends with us, sharing, mm. sharing this information out with the, the community in general. And mm. what can we, as a 3D print community, as an industry, learn mm. from the fact that you're sharing this data and information, and mm. also from your continued the continued investment that hp has been making in this marketplace well one the continued in investment is there is there is an opportunity in 3d printing and the big opportunity is to participate in the in the final parts market you know while we're in prototyping the size of the industry is kind of the size that it is with some stable growth if we can start to capture part of final manufacturing that's that's big big business. I, I'm talking about orders of magnitude bigger than 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 prototyping. The sharing is part of a maybe philosophy of HP in particular in the 3D print industry, which is, you know, I don't want to fight with other people over a small prototyping business. I don't. You know, I need to steal market share from you. You need to steal market share with me. This is this is. This is not the game. The game, what we've said is when the tide rises, all the ships rise. Yeah. And the sharing of information is to, is to make sure that everybody understands the value propositions that we're trying to drive awareness of for the rest of the world are very common, whether you're talking about HP, MJF, or somebody else's process, the value propositions of time to market the value propositions of digital supply chains, they're the same. And if we can get the world to start to acknowledge that, then we all get it some portion of this final part manufacturing market and we all grow and we all grow together. Wow. You know, that. thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, that's been our goal here at the show. And that's why we're so excited by this, this partnership on, on sponsoring the series to get to talk to great people like you, Ed. So thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Okay, great. Thanks for your time, Tracy. Thomas, have a good afternoon. Stuck at home. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> well, Tracy, there's a few things, especially from the latter part of that interview that really jump out at me. And, and I'm going to boil it down to three things. Number one, what Ed talked about, about the big picture, the future is end use part manufacturing not prototyping and not just. sampling not just right, right. but yeah. that the, the big you know but but you heard it in his voice saying the market there the the real huge market that will eclipse the size of where 3d printing has been living okay it's been living in this you know testing prototyping world while you and I always had the vision of using end use parts making final products it's not easy to do and most well, of the market what, has been in prototyping right that's what we found out I mean that was the whole premise for the start of this show was to start to understand what those challenges were were we going to be able to make a successful business in it is this the right place for us and I think after 560 original episodes, we decided no. I mean, we had decided no a lot earlier than that, but we really decided no, there wasn't a place for us. But after these kind of conversations that we've been having on this series, especially this one with, with Ed Davis, is just that I'm excited that there seems to be a lot of solutions and a path yeah, that's towards the word it, I was right? Use too. There's a path towards that that says, maybe within five years, you and I ought to be reinvesting our time and energy into that energy strategy we saw a decade ago. And, and it really does take that kind of time, I right. think, to get there. So, so then the second thing is seeing how HP has been approaching this with not only researching and identifying these mega trends, but then openly sharing that information was very encouraging to me and it comes back to a term, Tracy, you and I have talked about called coopetition, which is that they're really not worried about, you know, hoarding the information, keeping it exclusive to AP, uh, HP, and just keeping it to themselves. They recognize 
the industry is larger than HP. It's for really the whole world to advance. And if they can share that information and help move the industry forward faster, then they're going to do it. And so, yeah, they're going to be sharing it, it with some competitors. Effect. They're going to be, but they're also cooperating. And then they hear the word coopetition. But the third thing that really screamed out to me is something that only a company like HP could do. This garden industry that started as these, you know, patents expired from the 80s and fostered the desktop 3D printing industry and the surge of interest. Interest and hype and boom, right? right? <laughs> they, while that is wonderful and I've enjoyed, you know, being a part of it in some small way and using all of these things in our own businesses, in order to go and toward the future where someday we do get to that Star Trek level replicator vision, it takes leadership and only a company like Hewlett Packard that is established has the resources to do things at a whole nother level and put all the research yeah. in. They only, it takes that kind of a company to, to take that leadership role and go and well, because we're and talking execute. about changing industry standards we're talking about incorporating data we're talking about incorporating like the all of the other things like the the big data the iot the like you're talking about incorporating all of those things the resources required to do that and the number of divisions and to getting them to work together that's how you're going to accelerate the innovation so yeah i'm glad somebody's still taking a leadership role and um and is really like taking it as a mission and that's what this seems like. The megatrends seem like a mission in a way to say, if we make this out there for everyone to see, we're going to help move this whole industry forward. We're going to help them all see their place in that role. And they're also not going to be fearful of all the investments that they're making as they go because it has a place and there's other companies like HP of a bigger size doing these kinds of investments. So that means there's a marketplace for it. There's a marketplace for it. And, you know, really kudos to HP for putting the investment into it. I mean, this is not just an investment in one machine and one technology. This is an investment in the industry. Right. It's, it's significant. Yeah. So, you know, and I like the industry 4.0 thing. I, that's one mm -hmm. of like my takeaways of it. When I first talked to Ed about it, I was like, I love the idea of this because for us, this is like when you're scaling a business and while we've been on hiatus, as we mentioned in our last episode that we've been, while we've been on a hiatus, we've been scaling a podcast production business. And while a lot of it is service, there are products involved in it. But this is what has frustrated me in the in sequencing of it. When we were really small, everybody talked or overheard each other and we knew kind of what was going on. So you could be flexible and nimble and you could solve problems and design would get involved or we'd we'd fix something, a flaw in the in the in you know in the coding or something like that. We'd be able to fix that and go of that. Now that we've gotten to a certain size where we don't have full automated systems in place to report back data or machine learning and you know AI kind of systems in place. We're at that in-between stage of where we have now teams and people, the report back structure is so slow. And it frustrates me from a designer standpoint, right? Like we want the data to flow faster through this process. So you can even see it in a small microcosm as you try to scale your business, you'll experience these, these stages. And what we ideally want to get back to is how it was when it was small, only we don't want to keep small. We want to, we want to grow big, right? So I could see how that industry 4.0, being able to create that process and system understanding for it and the incorporation of these emerging technologies, that's going to help almost every company understand that scaling process better and create the flow for any type of complex product or system to be able to be manufactured, produced, developed out there. And I love that idea. That just takes so much out of it and keeps us in the invention and innovation role, right? In the creative space, <laughs> which is really where we like to be. That's sure. right. So anyway, that excites me as well to see that going on. Um, so I am, I'm excited to keep up on that. One of the things that I want to make sure that everybody knows is you can go back to 3dstartpoint.com. We have the blog post for this episode, all the links, the video, and the and there's, a, there's a whole slide share and all kinds of things that they've shared with us that you'll be able to access. So you definitely want to go through it. it it's greatly detailed. I mean, I think the, the, the slide share on the 2020 update for the megatrends was like a couple hundred slides. 
So like it's big. There's a lot of data and a lot of information on all the different little details and all what he was calling the subcategories or subtrends that are underneath it. So you'll definitely want to check that out and you can do that at 3dstartpoint.com. We also have 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP, which will get you to all the resources within this series. So you'll be able to find them all in one place as well. All right. Well, hey, again, thank you to Edward Davis for coming on the show today. And uh, you know what? We're really excited to continue to bring you this special series. And uh, we'll be back with the next one real soon. So thanks for listening to WTFFF. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D. 